Good morning, everybody. Well, we're back in lockdown again, and I'd like this morning to just think about what actually motivates us to get out of bed in the morning. What does it make us feel we want to do each day? What concerns us? What drives us? What directs our thinking, our rules or our actions? What controls how we spend our money? Is it ourselves, our families, our work, our leisure, what bit we can get at the moment? Is it planning the next holiday, should it ever be possible to have one again? Or is it planning how we can help a neighbour or a friend? What really makes us tick? I'd just like to start with reading a few verses from Genesis chapter 32. You might think this is a bit of an odd passage, but as we unpack it together, we'll be able to see where, I, where we're getting to. Jacob wrestles with God. That night, Jacob got up and took his two wives, his two female servants and his eleven sons, and crossed the ford of the Jabbok. After he had sent them across the, across the stream, he sent over all his possessions. So Jacob was left alone, and a man wrestled with him till daybreak. When the man saw that he could not overpower him, he touched the socket of Jacob's hip, so that his hip was wrenched as he wrestled with the man. Then the man said, Let me go, for it is daybreak. I'm reminded of the story of the visiting Methodist minister who turned up at a country church on an absolutely foul night to take the service. And to his horror, he found only one old lady in the congregation. Well, he'd stuck to his plan and he announced the first hymn. Charles Wesley's hymn, number 445. Come, O thou traveller unknown, whom still I hold but cannot see. My company before is gone, and I am left alone with thee. With thee all night I mean to stay and wrestle till the break of day. At which point the old lady picked up her handbag, stood up and walked out saying, That they don't, Reverend, I'm going home. Well, here we have Jacob just about to cross the ford of the Jabbok. And what is the situation he finds himself in? We know who Jacob was. Basically, he was a swindler. He was a cheat. He was a thief. He'd conned his father-in-law out of flocks and herds and all sorts of things. He'd stolen his brother's birthright. But he was also a husband a father and a brother. He was touched by God. He'd been blessed in his life, but he was fearful of the future like so many people are at the moment. And dreading what could happen the following day when he confronted Esau for the first time in many years since dealing his birthright, look at his scheming. Everyone else has been sent ahead. Waves and waves of herds and flocks and servants and his family, just in an attempt to pacify and curry favour with his brother. Jacob is to be the last man to reach Esau. He's got it all planned. And a man comes to wrestle with him. He's no idea who he is. And he wrestles with him all night. Even after having his hip dislocated, Jacob will not let go of the man until the man blesses him. And the story continues in verse 27. The man asked him, what is your name? Jacob, he answered. Then the man said, your name will no longer be Jacob, but Israel, because you have struggled with God and with humans and have overcome. Concern for blessing, safety and promise produces almost superhuman strength in Jacob, and it leads to his realisation that he's actually seen God and lived. Jacob said, please tell me your name. 
But he replied, why do you ask my name? And then he blessed him there. So Jacob called the place Peniel, saying, it is because I saw God face to face, and yet my life was spared. The sun rose above him as he passed Peniel, and he was limping because of his hip. Jacob strove all night to receive a blessing. How much do we strive for blessing? Is that what motivates us? How important is it to us? Or do we just take what comes without really being concerned? Jacob was truly motivated. And by that stage, he was concerned for himself, his family and his future and his relationship with his brother. His striving with God produced all sorts of results. It produced blessing. It produced assurance of what was to come. And it produced determination. Do we strive with God in order to know his blessings? Or do we just largely ignore him because we're too bound up with our own affairs? It's very, it's very easy to fall into that trap at the moment where we're wondering what's going to happen tomorrow, the week after, beginning of December, whenever. Let's look at the, that full hymn. Come, O thou traveller unknown, whom still I hold but cannot see. My company before is gone, and I am left alone with thee. With thee all night I mean to stay, and wrestle till the break of day. I need not tell thee who I am, my misery or sin declare. Thyself has called me by my name. Look on thy hands and read it there. But who, I ask thee, who art thou? Tell me thy name and tell me now. In vain thou strugglest to get free, I never will unloose my hold. Art thou the man that died for me, the secret of thy love unfold? Wrestling I will not let thee go, till I thy name, thy nature know. Yield to me now, for I am weak, but confident in self-despair. Speak to my heart, in blessings speak. Be conquered by my instant prayer. Speak, or thou never hence shalt move, and tell me if thy name is love. Tis love, tis love, thou diedst for me. I hear thy whisper in my heart. The morning breaks, the shadows flee. Pure universal love thou art, to me, to all, thy mercies move, thy nature, and thy name is love. That's the person of our Lord. And if we do strive with God and receive his blessings, what do we do with them? In Matthew 14, Jesus feeds the crowd with his disciples present. And it's a very interesting conversation that goes on between Jesus and the disciples. You can imagine it. Jesus starts it, he's responding to the people's needs and he has compassion and he does something about it. He'd healed the sick and now he challenges the disciples. You know, these people need food. And the disciples say, well, yes, they do need food, but send them home, they'll have some there. We can't do anything about it. And Jesus turns it round and says, but you feed them. And the disciples say, oh, yeah, right. You know, you all we've got here are five rolls and a couple of mackerel. You're having a giraffe. You're having a laugh. There's thousands of them. What good is that? And Jesus says, all right. Give it to me. Get them to sit down. And I'll show you what can be done. And the result is that everyone has more than enough after the blessing of the food. There's loads left over. And the disciples have an object lesson in the fact that if God blesses something or someone, then anything is possible. So how does the fact that he can affect our thoughts or our concerns or our lives? Numbers 23, 19 says, God is not human that he should lie, not a human being that he should change his mind. Does he speak and then not act? Does he promise 
and not fulfill? Do we have confidence in our faithful God? Is he our motivation to face each day? Malachi chapter 3 and verse 10 says, Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house. Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that there will not be room enough to store it. Do we really get hold of the idea that if we sell out for him, he will honour it? And it will also determine where our hearts lie. There's a very real sense that he can. And if he can, are we prepared to say, we will? He wants to bless us. Like Jacob, we should strive for that blessing so that we can be a blessing to others day by day. Let's pray. Father of all mercies, we bless you for our creation. The life we possess is your gift. We hold it in trust from you. Teach us to value it and to use it to the full. For we have but one life to live on earth, one life in which to glorify you, to serve your church, to advance your kingdom, to help other people. Lord, show us what to do with our life. And let us not live to be useless. For we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.
greatest. Is the 